Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, on behalf of Horasis, I am delighted to welcome you to the 2018 Horasis Global Meeting in this wonderful and beautiful city of Qashqais. The Horasis Global Meeting aims to be the world's foremost gathering of global business leaders who interact with key government officials and um, thought leaders from all around the world. The meeting's purpose is to advance solutions to the most critical um, challenges facing corporations today. Under the theme, Inspiring Our Future, participants will share insights on the current state of the world, which looks actually very fragile and fractious these days. Ladies and gentlemen, with the Horasis Global Meeting, we would like to overcome the current difficulties in the world. War, uh, geopolitical threats, of course, the threats by climate change and the environment, and uh, try to find solutions. We want to shape the future. We want to inspire the future. The Rastis Global Meeting is supported by many institutions from Portugal and the world. And my thanks go, ladies and gentlemen, to the city of Cascais for hosting us and to the government of Portugal. Now I would like to call on Bernardo Barros, who is the Vice President of the City of Cascais, for his welcoming words. Please welcome Bernardo Barros. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friend Frank Richter, dear future ambassadors of Cascais, welcome to Cascais, welcome to my lovely village, welcome to the charm of the Atlantic coast, welcome to the best place to live for one day or a lifetime. Cascais is delighted to host the Oasis Global Meeting 2018. Since most of you just arrived, allow, allow me to give you a bird-eye view of my village. Yes, we still call it a village, despite of the fact that we are the fifth largest city in the country. Cascais is a young village that just completed its 654th anniversary. As you can see, we are located at the seashore, 25 minutes away from Lisbon and 25 minutes away from the Lisbon airport. We have 207,000 warm inhabitants in a beautiful territory of 90 square kilometers, but one third of our territory is a natural park. As neighbors, we have the beautiful Sintra, a World Heritage Site by UNESCO, and of course, the Atlantic Ocean, the starting point for Portuguese big adventures. Cascais is proud to be a land of kings and fishermen. And yes, the fishermen are still there, not the kings, of course. And talking about kings and five-star hotels, we, you may know that during the Second World War, Portugal was a neutral country, and we had more five-star hotels than kings at the time. We had more kings without a throne than five-star hotels, and we will have 20 hotels five-star in 2021. We are exploding. At a time, as to real, a little parish of Cascais, the place where this beautiful Congress Center is located, is the same place that we used to held Formula One and MotoGP Grand Prix. As you may know, we were a very, very big melting pot. That even Ian Fleming, an MI6 spy, started to write these first lines of 007 in the Palace Hotel, the hotel where most of you are hosted. And actually, the real Casino Royale is not the Casino Royale, is the Casino Estoril, the place where you will have dinner tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to tell you why kings and the most famous people of the world choose Cascais to live. What was the reason that brought them to Cascais? You may think that they wanted to live in Cascais because of our wonderful beaches, of our magnificent mountains, or you may even think that they moved to Cascais because we have the best fish in the world. But the reason is that they moved to Cascais because of the warm people of Cascais and not because of the 300 days of sun that we have. I know that this might find hard for most of you to understand because most of you, the summer happens on a specific Wednesday. 
I believe, and I'm sure, that the people of Cascais was that reason. In Cascais, we believe that the best thing in our territory is our people. The strategy of Cascais is to create the best place to live one day or a lifetime. To ensure this strategy that competes every day with the major cities in the world, we must guarantee to our inhabitants and to, know, to our tourists a several number of items. We must guarantee that our territory is safe and clean. And Cascais is the safest city in the country, and Portugal is the third safest country in the world. We must guarantee that we have not a welfare state, but a welfare society, and we have. We have to guarantee to all the 100 nationalities that chosen Cascais to live, our beloved expats, 20% of our population, a variety of international schools for their children, and we have 14. We know that education is our future. So next year, on the next Oasis Global Meeting, when you arrive to Cascais, we will have four universities. To create the best place to live one day or a lifetime, we have to con continue to invest in culture, and we have 17 museums. We will continue to support major events like the World Championship of Surf, or the Global Champions Tour on horse jumping, or even the ATP tennis event that is simultaneously happening in Cascais with Oasis, and major music events, and of course, golf. Yes, golf. We know that business, business people like you love golf, so we have seven golf courses just for you. We will continue as well to attract international meetings like this one, and so important they are for us. In Cascais, you will find a, pl a place to live, the best one. You will find a lovely past and history, but essentially a place with a tremendous future, because Cascais is for sure the future. Dear delegates, dear Oasis friends, in Cascais we work as one. We work closely with the city and with the government. We work with the hotels and every player in order to make you feel at home. We facilitate business. We help business creation because we know that together with education and investigation, they are the engine of growth. We integrate and as I said, we work as one towards Cascais future. Today, like in the past, we are facilitators. Today, like in the past, we are amazing hosts. And be sure that we are doing our very best to make you feel at home in this Oasis Global Meeting. But we want more. We want to talk to you about the future and the future of your companies in Portugal, if possible, in Cascais. Believe my words, we won't disappoint you. Ladies and gentlemen, Probably you won't have the time to visit our lovely village. You won't have the time to visit our museums or our outstanding beaches. Probably you won't have the chance to taste our variety of foods and you don't have the time to visit our natural park. But next year at Oasis Global Meeting 2019, bring your families. Stay a few more days. Who knows, maybe to live a lifetime. Have a wonderful evening, have a wonderful Congress, but have the notion that now that you know the history of Cascais, you are ambassadors of Cascais. Thank you, Frank Richter, for bringing these amazing delegates and, taking, and thank you for choosing Cascais. Dear ambassadors, enjoy the rest of the meeting and please come back to live for a day or a lifetime. Thank you. Well, I should start. Um, welcome to this plenary session on leveraging sustainable development. My name is Richard Lister. I've been a correspondent for the BBC for the past 30 years, which probably shows a terrible lack of imagination. Um, about 10 years of that, I was based in the United States uh, as a foreign correspondent, which took me to about 50 countries, and I'm now back in London, more or less focused on uh, Europe and, and the UK. 
My role today is to chair this panel as we consider the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. So I'd like you all to imagine a world without poverty, where all people have access to food, education, and healthcare, where rich countries help poor countries access financing and technology. Everyone has a reliable energy supply, and most have employment. Economic growth in this world benefits everybody and not at the expense of the planet, because in this world, ecosystems are protected, oceans and forests are properly managed, and global warming is kept in check. Now, after imagining that, imagine that all of this can be achieved in the next 12 years. And if you can do that, you have, in a nutshell, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that was agreed by the United Nations General Assembly in September 2015. There are 17 of these global goals, and they are backed by 169 detailed targets. They were built on the Millennium Development Goals, which expired in 2015. And the new goals don't differentiate between developed and developing countries. They apply equally to all countries. Every nation is responsible for integrating the goals directly into their own national policy. In the words of this document, this agenda is a plan of action for people, prosperity, and the planet. And as the then UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, there is no plan B because there is no planet B. For some, these goals are the embodiment of what the United Nations is for. It's a project to build global consensus uh, on improving the lives of everyone in the planet and then implement, implementing that global consensus in the world's agendas. For others, this is a sprawling, naive project with contradictory goals. How can you promote economic growth and increase standards of living around the world while at the same time protecting the world's resources? Is investing in smallholder farms really compatible with providing proper nutrition and food security for the hungriest people on the planet? Universal health care is great, but who pays for it? Where does the money come from? And the goals do have their critics. Pure fantasy, sneered the economist, which also estimated that the cost of meeting these goals was about 4% of global GDP at a time when Western governments are spending less than half of 1% on international aid and development. So, more than two years since this grand project came into force, what are we learning about it? How can it be realized? What more needs to be done? And when it comes to meeting these goals, should we be eager-eyed optimists or clear-eyed realists? Over the next hour or so, we'll get the thoughts of our panel uh, in the order you see here. Uh, Robin Niblett is director of the Royal Institute of International Affairs at Chatham House in London, one of the most respected independent policy institutes in the world. He was previously executive vice president at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., which is another of the most respected independent policy institutes in the world. Anna Lehmann, Secretary of State for Industry here in Portugal, is a professor of economics. She spent two decades in academia, public policy and business, and she specializes in business globalization, innovation, and public policy. Robert Doucet, who's been uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation for Togo since September 2013, is also a professor of politics and philosophy. He's written extensively about barriers to African development, and he's also a novelist. And Simone Filippini uh, is a former ambassador to Macedonia many years ago, but you have 30 years experience in the international public sector. She's now executive director at the Netherlands Institute for Multi-Party Democracy, which focuses on peace, justice, and the importance of strong institutions. Now, um, each of uh, these panelists will give a brief presentation before we have a discussion, and maybe we'll have time too to open some questions up to the audience. But ladies and gentlemen, your panel. We had a bit of a chat about who was going to uh, start the presentations, and uh, Robin, you either pulled the long straw or the short straw, I don't know which <laughs> it is, but please, if you'd like to start. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Um, thanks for the opportunity, and delighted to be part of this dialogue. And I think for me, it's, it's the right straw, because uh, I can maybe be a little bit contextual and share some thoughts about the SDGs, and then hear from the practitioners in a minute and how they're, how they're dealing with it from a practical standpoint. 
Um, I suppose I want to make sort of four quick sets of comments. Uh, first of all, kind of what's driving uh, the SDGs, what's different about them? Um, uh, why are they, in my mind, a process of sort of adaptation from the Millennium uh, Development Goals? A little bit about the obstacles uh, that are cropping up already, um, and a little bit about the framework in which we can do something about it. Um, the first point I want to make, as I said, the, the SDGs are not just the MDGs Mark II. They're not simply a continuation. They are a reflection, I think, of at least four big changes taking place at the moment and that we've seen over the last few years. The first has been uh, the rise of inequality um, and insecurity. And the fact that this inequality and insecurity is not just a feature of the developing world, but as much a feature of the developed world. And obviously, this was not something that people predicted before the MDGs, but that really came to the fore towards uh, the tail end. The second point which is linked to this is, is a real fear that the world uh, will never regain the levels of productivity uh, 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 progress that occurred in the early 2000s. If you look at productivity rates, their real peak was between 2003 to 2007, and they've been declining globally, developed and developing world and emerging markets since that because of aging populations, uh, leveling out of some of the big uh, uh, gains in productivity from technology uh, of the late uh, 80s, early 90s, a kind of maturing of global supply chains. Um, the third big factor which is changing everything, of course, is technology and the kind of nexus of data and information communication and technology. I mean, this is a disruptive environment which could be promise, but it could also be a disruptive environment which takes away huge opportunities for jobs and growth, in particular for women around much of the world. And I suppose the fourth big change that's taken place since uh, the Millennium Development Goals were done is that we're really experiencing the negative effects of climate change and resource stress in a big way. The decline in arable land, the increase of extreme weather events, uh, uh, the growth of migration, some of it driven not just by conflict, but also by uh, climate extremes. So that, those are some of the features, I think, that are driving this different SDG drive compared to the, the MDGs. Um, and a way the SDGs, my sort of second point, are a form of adaptation. You've got a new goal, uh, number 13, which is about tackling inequality with this phrase of leaving no one behind, tackling vulnerable communities, looking not just in the aggregate, a growth, but being able to look even inside the differentiations within countries. Let's not take aggregate numbers. By the way, this also applies to America or to Britain or to Portugal uh, uh, as much as it does to a country like Ghana. Where is the differentiation? You might have areas that do well, areas that do badly. Communities that do well in a country, others that do badly. Workers who do well, but disabled people who do badly. And again, the SDGs are really trying to be much more granular and inside the problem than the MDGs were. You've also got a focus on innovation in there, not just the big blocky stuff like infrastructure, uh, which people uh, associated so much with the first lot. Um, as I said, a big focus on climate change, but also I thought very interesting on uh, a sustainable consumption. Here we have a massive increase in middle class consumption of meat, different use of, of, of agriculture. Uh, the SDGs, I think, have really adapted to try and understand how this is a, a risk as well as an opportunity. And then one of the most important elements, and politically sensitive, which I think we'll come back to, is the inclusion of peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, this really gets to the political dimension um, of change, which uh, you know uh, maybe was ignored a little bit on the MDGs. Now, third point, quickly, how are we doing? Um, I'm certainly not going to go through all 17 um, and do any kind of bilan uh, on this uh, or, or judgment on them all. You can read the 2017 report put out by the UN, UN under Antonio Guterres. It goes through each one of the 17, uh, uh, giving you a sense. What's interesting about it is that most of it says it's too early to tell. And most of the reports are actually where did we get to in 2015 rather than where are we now in 2017 or 18. But you can see a few features of what's going to make it very difficult to get where we want to get to by 2030. And again, I'll just rattle through them to maybe uh, for people to come back. There are declining levels of global foreign direct investment. 
One of the big drivers of opportunity has been the flow of foreign direct investment. We are not catching up. Those levels are not increasing. There is rising debt around the world, not only in the developed countries, which remain quite high in debt, but also increasingly in both the developing and emerging markets. Will the money be there? I don't know, whether it's for infrastructure or for innovation. Um, urbanization. Having mixed effects, uh, urbanization can be good, but not if it increases the amounts of slum dwellers. Slum dwellers are decreasing proportionately, but increasing in absolute terms as urbanization uh, takes place. Um, again, we'll get, I think, later on in the panel to the positive impacts of information communications and technology. But one of the things it's doing right now, as uh, Jim Kim of the World Bank has pointed out, it's increasing levels of what people call reference income. People look and say, hold on, I can see how well other people are doing. I expect my income, my level of life, to be at that standard. If I don't get it, I'll go to it. I will change my location if I can't change my circumstance. One of the big drivers of migration. Um, on climate change, we're probably, uh, we're, well, we're certainly not going forward um, as quickly uh, as we would like. Um, and I have to say, I think one of the big unknowns on the political justice uh, institutional side is we are seeing a rise of uh, a loss of political liberties, a loss of human right capacity, and a rise of authoritarianism around much of the world. Freedom House does some very interesting reports on this. And really, for the last 12 years in a row, we've seen a net decline in the number of uh, more democratic countries compared to, to less. Um, and you have to wonder at that point, is that going to make worse one of the real obstacles in the world to effective growth, or will it mitigate it? And that is corruption. Um, you know, in the end, some very interesting studies done, I, I can quote more about them later on, roughly uh, uh, three times more goes out of the developing world in illicit capital flows out to uh, uh, you know, uh, shady offshore banks and other places of that sort than goes in in terms of support, whether it's an investment or foreign aid. Um, and we're going to have to buck that trend. And finally, we have a much more zero-sum world politically. Richard, you mentioned a minute ago a bit more about the politics. Um, we are seeing that as countries try to fix the inequities within their countries, you end up with mantras like America first, or Britain first, or Russia first, or take your pick. Um, everyone wants to be first. Everyone wants to take care of their own people. Then you have a rise of protectionism. You start to close down markets. You don't see opportunity. And you see, as we've seen now, the share of the world's poor living in fragile or conflict-prone countries has grown from about 19% in 1990 to over 40% in 2012. We're probably over 50% today. So I will close just by saying a few of the what-to-dos which well, I'm maybe sure. we, we well, should maybe come I'll back to those. We should maybe come back to those because I'm aware yeah. that uh, we have Five a minutes. fair amount to get through. Um, Simone, um, we had a, a good overview from Rob in there about a number of the issues. Peace, justice, security, those are issues that you are very much focused on. Yes. So if you could just give us some thoughts about that okay. part of the SDGs. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, so if, if you think of the images you see every day on television, like destruction, of Aleppo, that city like Aleppo or Homs in Syria, Mosul in Iraq. If you see those parts of the 65 million plus refugees trying to find refuge in other parts of the world or within their own countries. If you have the pictures in front of you of the haves and have nots of the world living in the same country but with totally different circumstances, uh, if you see those pictures, you, you can only be shocked about those situations. And the thing is, the cynical thing is, that they're all, but most of them, man-made. And the, you see disproportionate amounts of efforts, money, um, and what have you, being put in destruction, in negative concepts, in destroying opportunities for others, and if you then look at the amounts of money and efforts that are being put in trying to, to build peace, security, um, and prosperity for all, that's totally disproportionate. And um, what, what we feel is that if you can break it, you can fix it. And, and that is the, the optimistic 
view of it. <laughs> and how can we do that? It's really interesting, by the way, that throughout the day today, an, a number of issues have come to the fore, and they have all to do with peace uh, and security and prosperity for all for the future. Things like corruption, you, you mentioned them al already. Um, inequality, exclusion, bad governance, governance not performing for citizens, disempowerment of citizens and the lack of voice that they have, uh, the decline of democracies and, um, and poverty. And so you, you can say, so um, which countries score best in, or score very well in most of the rankings in the world? So what is it that they, they have to show for? Uh, what do they, those countries have in common? And you can see that while their systems show many differences and varieties, their politicians consistently focus on performing for the common good, for citizens to flourish. Their political culture and systems provide an enabling environment for peace, stability, security, social economic growth, and opportunities for all. And what they also have is the balance of power. There's accountability built in their systems, and it works. Um, I think that the, so basically you could say, we, we have the, the examples lying in front of us. If we look at them, you can say, okay, why, why don't we copy them? And I think the SDGs form a perfect, perfect framework that we can all build on to work on these issues. And aspects that we as the, the Netherlands Institute for Multi-Party Democracy work on is basically on SDG, 16 mostly, which is about peaceful societies, was a very contentious SDG because many leaders who are leaders of countries that don't perform well on being peaceful and having strong institutions and a strong rule of law, they didn't like that SDG because it's going to bring to the fore where this, the system is failing. And another one is number 10. Well, we have heard it throughout today. It's about inequality inequality within societies, but also broader inequality in the world. And another one is SDG 5, which is about gender equality, and I also like to include inequality in terms of including young people. There is now a UN Security Council resolution on youth, number 2250, they always have numbers. It's a very important one, it's the, the first one that is really focused on inclusion of youth, and we have a huge, huge uh, youth bulge in the world at this moment, especially, for example, in Africa, but also to a certain extent in Latin America and Asia. In Europe, that's a different situation, but youth needs to be included. Um, so long-term security and stability will never be achieved by military means, and many leaders want to speak about military uh, issues and security if they talk about peace. But in the end, building schools, hospitals, and roads is tremendously important, but we need to tackle the political dimension. Mr. Niblet already talked about the political dimension that needs to be included at the same time, needs to be urgently tackled. We live in nation states. If those nation states' leadership don't tackle the preconditions to build peaceful and stable and prosperous societies, it will not going to happen despite all the technological issues that we have to work. And I can talk about some of the possible suggestions, but we'll do that Certainly. later because you want to come back to that. That, that in the sounds like stage. a good point at which to bring in, Minister Duse, uh, the importance of, of nation states in, in tackling the root causes of <laughs> instability, particularly regional instability. And I know you've, you've written about this before in, in Africa, uh, but perhaps you could give us some insight into how your own country, Togo, has been able to integrate the uh, Sustainable Development Goals into Togo's national agenda. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, in uh, 2015, I was in New York during the Extraordinary Summit when we adopted the 17 uh, indicator of uh, SDG. You know, in, uh, in Africa, uh, when we, in, uh, in 2015, when we adopted the indicators, it's like for us, uh, is all the indicators, the SDG indicators, is for Africa, or the power, the, the power countries. We, I was with my president, and I, I discussed with him, 
I told him, President, I think it's not it's unfair. When all the points is like for Africans' country. But after, uh, after a few months, right now we can say the SDDs, the, the, adoption, the adoption of SDDs is a, a very good thing for us in Africa. Because you know in Africa, when you are, uh, where you are not African people, or you, are, you come from Europe, from USA, Africa is like, uh, you know, is a bad continent. Everything, every bad things is, you, you can see in Africa. Right now, you know, Africa is the continent of the, uh, Africa is the continent of the future. We have a lot of resources in Africa. We can do a lot of things in Africa. But the first decision is our, our decision. You need to take, you need to keep our destiny. When you see as, uh, SDDs right now, SDDs like framework come to help us to, to, to decide ourselves. For example, our development plan on five, on five years, everything you want to do for our population. But unfortunately, one of the parts of Africa, we have the problem about uh, instability. We need peace, we need stability, we need, uh, we need to work together between us, between African countries. The problem is when we don't have a peace or we don't have a, stability, a political and social stability, we can, do for, we, can be, we can do something for F S uh, SDG. That way we think we need first one, peace and stability. And if we have a vision for our countries or for our continents, we can use only or we can work only with uh, SDGs uh, indicator for the development of uh, African countries. And we say we, can, we, we need to, to work between us and to, to, sh to, to share our idea our development idea with uh, a European country, with a USA, with, you know, a, another countries in the world, because uh, we know right now the, the indicators of SDGs is not, is, is for us, is for, uh, is for the happiness of uh, African population. So there we go. We've heard that this is an opportunity for Togo. Now, clearly, the, the, the pressures on, on Portugal are entirely different. You don't have a peace and stability problem. But Secretary Lehman, perhaps you could give us a, a bit of an insight into what opportunities you see for Portugal and for other countries in Western Europe, perhaps, from these SDGs. Yes, first of all, good afternoon to you all. It's a pleasure to have you all here in Portugal, and I hope you'll have a great conference. So, indeed, so focusing more on the Portuguese case, but, of course, with a wider interest and also focusing on the opportunities. First of all, Portugal fully endorses this universal set of goals. Uh, we are really committed uh, to the SDGs and we think that they are a great opportunity to advance several causes that we think uh, are very, well, have lots of merit uh, in all its dimensions. Just to brief you very quickly on the six SDGs that we decided to focus on. This is not to say that the others are not important, but of course we have to target some with greater importance. SDG 4, quality education. We've been a dictatorship until 74. We like behind in terms of indicators related to education. Furthermore, the current uh, speed at which change is happening, notably technological change, demands a very focused uh, answer to that. So clearly education is a priority and we have a very, very positive evolution in the last years, very positive. Uh, then gender equality, it's also a priority for us. We passed several pieces of legislation on this to speed up the process. We were also lagging behind, and we are still in some indicators. For example, quotas for uh, public administration management, but also in terms of listed companies. Uh, we feel that we needed to speed it up, and this is just an example, but there are other examples. 
The other one that uh, relates directly to what I'm, I do in government is SDG 9, related to industry, infrastructure, and innovation. I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on that later. Then, SDG 10, reducing inequality for us, fostering inclusion at all levels, uh, reducing poverty is also a major, major objective. Uh, then climate action, climate action, there's no planet V, as you very well said, so we really need to do something about it. There's a dimension in which we are very well uh, positioned. Energy, sustainable energy and renewable energy. We, are, we have a position of leadership internationally on that, both in technology and on using, producing as well. Finally, uh, but last but not least, protecting marine life. We have the largest coastal area in uh, Europe, so it's really very important for us. So this is the, this is the, these are the main areas of focus. Let me uh, just spend a couple of minutes on the opportunities. Uh, what I do uh, in terms of uh, my role in government is called industry, but there are two main areas of focus. The so-called Industry 4.0, digitization of economy, then entrepreneurship and startups. And it's a very good angle also to um, relate to SDGs. Because the so-called fourth industrial revolution is a clean, so-called revolution, I could delve on that, but it's not the right time. But uh, it's clean. It's quite interesting, uh, the potential that it has to help decarbonizing the economy. And this is also very important for several SDGs related to climate, etc. For example, the World Economic Forum Global E-Sustainability Index estimates that for each metric ton of CO2 emitted by the ICT sector, it helps users save 10 metric tons. So it's quite powerful, it's quite powerful. And if we think of the underlying technologies that are related to these new ways of producing but also of consuming, for example, with the use of platforms that commands a certain controversy nowadays, but they tend to be very friendly to climate. So this is a case in point. <coughs> Still, of course, challenges exist, for example, on the growth of e-waste, like data centers use up 2% of the global electricity, well, in the world. But what do we do related to this? Let me tell you about one of our priorities that also is blended with climate action. Circular economy. Circular economy is like a buzz expression nowadays, but it's really very important also for us. And it's important not only at the industrial level, but on the way we produce and consume in general. And it's also related to the specific SDG on that. Uh, we also, we are taking lots of measures. I don't have time to delve on that, but this is something very important. Let me give you just uh, another example to just to, to wrap up this first, um, first five minutes. We are very much in favor of encouraging entrepreneurship. So our focus on Industry 4.0 is on small and medium enterprises. But also it's very important to encourage the startup uh, dynamics. Uh, and in this case, let me give you, we also have lots of measures for that, but let me give you an example. Last week, uh, several members of government advanced um, a measure that is very important for us. It's called GovTech. So government needs also to lead by example. What is this? So we challenge the entrepreneurial sector, we challenge startups to help, but it's not focused on Portugal, it's to help uh, providing solutions, those who have already products and services, it's not ideas products and services that help advancing, advancing the 17 SDGs. And also we try to lead by example in the way we manage the challenge. We do it through blockchain technologies. It's quite interesting. Uh, and there are so many ways in which technology can help. For example, the blockchain and democracy is something that we could discuss. Uh, big data, something that, you know, some people have mixed feelings nowadays when they talk about that, but it's so powerful what big data can do for, in terms of informing, like, evidence-based policy and so many other things. So, indeed, I'll wrap up here and then we'll discuss maybe some things further. Robin, I see you've been writing frantically. 
Uh, yeah. the I always write frantically. There's always so much to write down. <laughs> um, uh, well, no, I mean, I, maybe starting with this last point about uh, blockchain and, and the innovations that are emerging on the technology side. Um, I think just there are remarkable uh, uh, chances here to connect people who were not connected before into the economy, um, particularly when you look at parts of sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, uh, maybe across Southeast Asia, especially agricultural communities that maybe won't have the opportunity to go through um, the sort of industrial period that we went through in much of Europe, where a lot of that industry in any case is not particularly value added in terms of employment. If you can turn agricultural opportunity rapidly into value added opportunities by getting into big markets from uh, uh, very small local areas, then you have huge opportunities. And I was involved in a panel earlier this year with uh, a lady who was built up her own uh, cocoa uh, and uh, coffee growing, actually it was a coffee growing plantation specifically, where being able to use uh, uh, data and connecting through, straight through to markets in the United States, through uh, orders that were uh, uh, listed in a blockchain uh, manner, completely cut the middleman, and it was a middleman, out of the operation entirely, completely changed her opportunity to grow her business. She felt she was empowered by it, she was able to employ more people, had more predictability on pricing, and you really felt the sort of transformation that had happened with one person who was helping employ 800, 900 uh, uh, smallholders around her particular operation. Let, so let me that's just in, one example. Yeah, let, let me bring in Minister Doucet on that. Uh, does, does Togo feel empowered by the digital revolution? Is this something which is making life better for entrepreneurs in your country? Of course, of course. I can tell you. If you see, for example, uh, Togo's situation, you know, Togo is a West African country because I don't know if everybody knows Togo here. <laughs> Togo is a small country between Benin, uh, Benin, Ghana, and, uh, uh, and uh, Burkina Faso. Our population is 7 million people. Right now, uh, if, you, if you, you see, because we adopted like a lot of African countries, the, all the indicators of uh, uh, SDGs, uh, our economy is growing up. Very, is not is, is growing up. Uh, first one because, uh, uh, of course, our government took uh, the, the decision. Uh, the, the decision. The second one, we have uh, we we have the the same currency in uh, West African region. We have we, we are seven countries. We have same currency and we work together because we 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 are member of uh, ECOWAS, and in ECOWAS. You can see our DTP right now. DTP right now, uh, we are five, five, five point one for the, the less one, and eleven for the country like uh, Cote d'Ivoire. But is that driven by factors which exist regardless of UN SDGs, or? Do the SDGs play into that process of developing these important factors which help drive your economy? Of course, of course. When you see the, 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 seven, uh, the, the 17 indicators, the first one, for example, you need to educate. When, uh, in 2005, for example, we have, when you take the education uh, for, for, for female and male, for female, the, uh, the, the level of education was uh, was eight percent. Right now, we, right now we are forty-two percent. For the for the boys, uh, in, 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 in two thousand five, we were uh, thirty-four. Right now, we are seventeen seventy-five percent. Just to tell you, we have, you can see, we can, we can see ourselves the effect of, uh, of this point. We can take another example uh, about agriculture. Uh, we, we take our agriculture. Uh, of course, we have a lot of, we have a lot of potential. This is a problem, we, the problem uh, what we have is in Togo and, and other African countries, we don't have, we, we don't have uh, transform our projects. You, we have a lot. We, we have uh, cocoa, 
in Togo, in Ghana, in, uh, in, in Côte d'Ivoire. Right now, when you see, of course, the price, sometimes the price is not good on the market, on the, in the, uh, the, the world market, but the product, uh, the product we have uh, uh, in, 2000, uh, not to, in 2010, uh, we had uh, 15,000 uh, 15, tons. Right now, uh, we are uh, around 35. So you've, you've had some really yeah, terrific yeah, yeah, growth yeah, yeah, in a number we of have, sectors. Yeah, of, yeah. of course, yeah. You made the point earlier that, particularly for, for parts of Africa, it is peace and, and security, which is really the enabler for growth. Um, and obviously this is something that, that, that you are, are particularly focused on. Some people have criticised the goals as being a sort of one-size-fits-all, which don't really, uh, don't really put enough emphasis on the most important bedrock goals for which everything else may follow. Do you believe that, in a way, it is peace and justice and, and social development which should be put at number one, two and three? of those goals before anything else? Well, I think the, the thing is that things have to go hand in hand, probably. You cannot say we need, we need peace and justice first and then we will tackle the other goals because there's no time. And there is a huge sense of urgency uh, these days to, to really achieve the goals. Of course, everybody knows climate, but also it's all connected. Uh, proper education, proper health, proper infrastructure, uh, climate change, all these issues are connected. But I think that a, a prerequisite for sustainable transformation is peace, security, inclusive governance. And for example, we are working on, um, because we are partic practitioners organization, you could say, we work in uh, different countries in the world, also like difficult ones like Myanmar and Burundi. And we work in Colombia, where we have a formal role in, in the implementation of the peace agreement and in some other countries on uh, promoting and facilitating more inclusive, responsive, accountable, transparent political culture and, and also to drive those actors to become more transparent and inclusive, to, to get into dialogue with each other intra-party but also between parties. And, and I, I think one of the uh, uh, former president of Tanzania uh, stated that the biggest obstacle to democratic development and stability in Africa today, for example, but that also goes for others, of course, it's not just Africa, uh, probably it also goes for ourselves eh, in, in Europe, is lack of trust among political parties and stakeholders. And that trust transforms into something else, constructive politics, and a, a, a stop to the winner-takes-all concept in politics. We see, for example, now in the US, and, and because everybody knows how it goes there, and it's a clear example, that there's a kind of zero-sum political gaming going on. So it's the one gets it all, and the others basically get nothing. And you know, if you look at democracy and the, the, the huge issue of inequality, it's about uh, respecting the needs and the rights of minorities. That's an integral part of democracy. And I think you already stated that democracy is, is, is dec in decline. There are more elections than ever, but deep, resilient democracy is in decline. And that's very important. It goes for Europe, it goes for the US, it goes for others. And we have to really fight each and any one of us. I could say some things about that, but um, maybe I, first the others. No, I think the situation, the African situation, is not, uh, you know, is, is not uh, simple like uh, somebody can think. Uh, you can take the, con the country like Sia uh, Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. How we can implement, for example, the S SDGs in Central African Republic, when you have, oh, wow. you have, you know, the, 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 the first priority for in know. Central African Republic, for example, is, is but, peace. But why do we have that war there? It has started because of social economic inequality. And it has grown into a religious kind of conflict, but it wasn't driven by religion. It was driven by social economic inequality of people, groups of people in the inside part of, of Central Africa. And, by, and, and, and it, the country is also being robbed with its huge wealth of, of, uh, of extractives. And that also is a driver, and there are other parties intruding. But 
the fact that the government has never really taken care of, and that maybe we haven't properly assisted the government uh, to take care of a more even uh, uh, development of the different groupings in the country. Let, that, let me put this out a little bit with, with Secretary Lehman. Um, clearly, this is a process which, to start with at least, is, is driven by politicians. Uh, but that there has to be a, an important role for the private sector too, especially when it comes to finance. Uh, how do you juggle those, those perhaps potentially competing interests? Yes, well, not always the interests are aligned, but I think more and more, and I think we all think that, uh, the public and private sector need to be aligned. And uh, more and more you see a uh, vast uh, number of partnerships emerging, both in the economic side and the social side. Uh, like, for example, our program for, I don't, I'm not going to detail it now, but our program on uh, the modernization and digitization of industry is a public-private program. And the first role is for the private sector, like privileging uh, spaces of diffusion, experimentation. But our role is rather to orchestrate. Of course, we provide incentives, etc. Um, but there are so many other, other aspects. For example, one issue that uh, uh, was alluded here at the beginning, for example, the challenges related to the future of work. And there's a vast discussion we could take on that, on uh, inequality, on uh, the effects of that. Uh, for example, the, the change, the, the pace of the change is so, so quick. That, for example, in terms of education, that is really crucial. Education is crucial to fight inequality, poverty, uh, for all the 17 goals, the other 16. So at the end of the day, if you think that the public sector traditional system can address the challenges of the fast pace of change, it's impossible. I, I, I don't like to use the word impossible, but alone it won't go there. What I'm implying is that also we need to find uh, the best framework also um, to speed up the adoption and the collaboration of the private sector. This is absolutely crucial. Of course, the, the public sector still has an important role to fulfill because very often you don't have the conditions or the incentives for the private sector to advance, especially if you are at the beginning, for example. We, and we need more and more to look ahead 10, 20 years. For example, what's happening with electric mobility, et cetera. And if the public sector doesn't help kicking in some of these developments, we will never go as fast. We will always lag behind, but we will never have the uh, enough pace and dynamic related. And Robin Niblett, so much of this does come down to money, doesn't it? Uh, and you spoke about rising debt, falling investment. Does that mean that the sort of momentum for achieving these goals inevitably dries up? Or do we find other ways of achieving some of these very ambitious targets? Well, I, I think the point that we're realizing is, is money isn't all of the answer. And obviously money is critically important. And to the extent that you can have really targeted foreign aid uh, from the developed world, let's say, to the developing countries, that is an important element in it. But we may not be able to rely on that vast wall of foreign direct investment that went out in the early to mid 2000s as global supply chains were being built and created and as technology was spread around the world as a way of creating a better return in many cases for the developed markets as well as they've rebalanced uh, uh, cheaper labor offshore for more expensive uh, labor onshore. Those sort of trade-offs seem to have, have hit their limit and now we're facing uh, a much more acute and explicit dilemma. I'll, I'll give the UK as an example. Uh, the UK faces the dilemma that on the one hand we like to say, and we are one of the biggest uh, contributors of foreign aid in the world, meeting 0.7% of GDP, 15 billion, maybe a little bit more than that, pounds going every year uh, on uh, foreign aid. But at the same time, uh, we are probably, if not indirectly, the UK is one of the transit points for a lot of the illicit extraction of the resources that should be in many cases, trickling down from those resource-rich countries into their populations. So we both pump the money in, and we're also part of the pipeline that draws it out. And, and that, that is a real dilemma to handle politically. And I'd say, if I can just say on this point, it is now an explicit dilemma that the government cannot hide from anymore. And you're seeing this debate taking place in the UK right now, not just with NGOs, banks and companies themselves, realizing that they can't be part of this problem, that the hypocrisy element 
which came up as well in one of the very interesting sessions I was at earlier on on the, the rise of radicalization amongst young people. The hypocrisy element is harder and harder to sustain mm -hmm. in today's more transparent world, and that's a good thing. And isn't there inevitably this, this tension between developed and developing countries in all kinds of areas, in terms of migration flows, in terms of, of protecting your, your domestic uh, industry? I mean, we, we see the growing rise, in, in certainly in the United States, but in other countries too, of protectionism, away from free trade, away from globalism, concerned about poorer countries who can make money by flooding foreign markets with cheap goods and those wealthier countries saying we don't want to have that as the solution to your problems because it creates a problem for us. Isn't this tension at the heart of what these goals are all about? It, it, in a way? Well, it, it's a tension if you're going to rely on the international system, I don't know, a new round, a, a new Doha round, yes, to try to drive the opportunity, the economic opportunity we saw there. If you're relying on that, I think the SDGs will be in trouble. But I think what we heard on the panel so far is you need a lot more sort of bottom-up from inside the country solutions rather than ones that are prescribed in large international agreements um, as the solution. I go back to the uh, ICT issues that uh, Minister Lehman was mentioning earlier, the technology element. There is a real danger. And again, if you look at the figures in the uh, UN's 2017 report on the SDGs, Improvements in education have stagnated, and they've stagnated in developing countries, the areas where they are most important. If you're not going to be getting greater investments in education in those countries, no amount of global trade, it doesn't even matter if there's more protectionism in the West, and if you're not creating a, a more educated workforce to be able to make that leap over from agrarian through industrial, straight through to the technology opportunities that Minister Lehman was describing. If you're not creating that opportunity, we're going to be in real trouble. So governments of as, en of as enablers of growth, we will use that phrase, uh, is the answer. And yeah, easy to say, difficult to do. The only other positive point to make here is, of course, you don't have to rely as much on public sectors to deliver education anymore. You can rely much more now on the private sector if you have the broadband connectivity. And that is being created, I think, by a lot of governments. So, Simone Filippini, do you find with the countries that you're working with that the solutions do have to come from within the country? Or is a measure of top-down helpful? No, 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 no. It's, you know, the, the kind of makeability from the outside as to what's happening inside countries is always very uh, limited, I think. So uh, any transformation in the end has to be country-owned and driven. And what is interesting, of course, in these days, that <clears throat> there are lots of influences, so networks which transcend all countries. So, uh, like we are here all together, coming from different parts of the world with different backgrounds, but we're influencing each other. We can help and support each other. And, and you see that happening more and more, which is important. <clears throat> of course, there are still many people in the world that are not connected to these great networks, and that also limits their opportunities for growth. Uh, <clears throat> and I think... Um, maybe because technology is, is, of course, on the table here big time. And technology, and look, if you look at technology and democracy, it has big pluses. Uh, if you look at social media, they've democratized the voice of people, uh, with also stumbling blocks there. Um, but uh, if you look, for example, as the introduction in China of the social credit system, that is worrisome. And that could also be copied, I don't know whether you know that so Perhaps credit you should explain system. just a little bit. I'm, I'm aware yeah. of the time, but um, yeah. see if you just give some context about that. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's a system whereby all data are being connected to each other, uh, uh, coupled to face recognition, and basically it gives a government that has its uh, uh, data uh, uh, system well in order uh, the opportunity to control the entire population by use of data. So there are pluses and minuses of all these um, uh, uh, very uh, fast, disruptive, uh, uh, disruptively growing technologies. But still, we, we need to get to, get to, to, uh, to terms with them, um, also to, uh, to, to get in, in that quest to create more inclusive, responsive, and accountable and transparent governments and governance systems. We are getting towards the end of our time, unbelievably. Is, are there any really? questions from, uh, from the audience? Any specific or general questions aimed at anybody here? Or, yes, gentleman in the middle, who I can see. So I'm pointing to you first. Uh, 
Thank you. Oh, that was quite loud. Um, my name is Menno Bart, and I have a specific question for Ms. Filippini, actually. Uh, you mentioned the importance of trust in political institutions and political actors, as well as between political actors like, like parties. Um, and therefore, I wanted to ask for your opinion about a specific case that was made by the Flemish author David van Rijbroek. I'm sure you, you know where this is going. He made a quite compelling case, actually, against elections. That's also the title of his against book. Against elections, did you against say? Against elections. And he makes the case that um, democracy is not necessarily equal to elections. In other words, uh, perhaps we can serve democracy in, a, in other ways. And he then mm. goes on to plead for randomly selecting citizens to make political decisions <laughs> and saying that okay. that's a better way to uh, In the interest of expediency, I think we've, we've, we've got I've the got gist. I've got the point. Um, yeah. Why not <laughs> no. benign dictatorship? Why not some other method yeah. if it achieves the end result? Well, certainly elections are no sign of real democracy. And we, we see in many countries, uh, I, I have been an election observer when I was the, uh, the, uh, the ambassador in Macedonia for the Netherlands, and there was infighting, boxes were open before, and I mean, those elections were fraudulent to an extent, even when the boxes were not opened, you know, just to people outside threatening people. I mean, there are hundreds of ways, and they become better and better in doing this in an invisible manner. So, are elections a sign of democracy? No, not per se. And I feel that if countries are not ready for real serious proper elections, you'd rather not do them because then they give a, they, they give a kind of flavor of democracy, which mo many times is not there. And also you saw that <coughs> international partners often then said, okay, they've now done uh, elections, so everything good, so we can go. Deep democracy is something that, that really starts, you know, building in the guts. And I've never felt more a Democrat than when I was ambassador in Macedonia, because I was talking about democracy all the time and tolerance and respect for diversity and all these issues that are part of democratic systems. And, you know, and I felt that it's deeply ingrained in my guts that it has something, is something which grew over generations. So your answer, answer? Well, I'm in favour of elections and <laughs> having people express their voices. Well, they're not the be-all and end. Not okay, let's see. Is there it's... another person? Maybe one last question before we <laughs> have to go. Sorry. <coughs> I'm Martin Bert from Paraguay. Aren't you worried that normal people don't understand what the sustainable development goals mean? They are too difficult for normal people in the world to understand. And uh, it seems that maybe there is an opportunity now to use technology to make them, to make all the students of the world understand the SDGs and to make normal people. It's still a government heavy, abstract concept for most of the people in the world. Does that worry you? Okay, let's ask, let's ask the two, the two um, senior government figures that we have here <laughs> about whether the people of Togo understand what these SDGs are all about, and whether they are aware of the impact that they may be having through their government's policy. Yes, you know, the, the impact of SDGs is, uh, is, uh, is, is real in, our, in, uh, in Togo and in our population. But you have to know in Togo, in, Afri in Togo and in Africa, when you see the people, you go to the village, you see the villagers, what, he, what the villagers need, he wants to eat. He want to eat. You can ask him, he want to, to have a cloth. He want to, to go to school. Uh, it's simple for us. That's why I say, I think uh, 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 the indicators of uh, SDGs is very important. And the first one for us, we need peace, we need stability to give food to the people, to the villagers, to, to give the good education, etc., etc., and one of uh, our uh, preoccupation is, uh, uh, you know, when you are in Africa, the, the African people. Uh, for lately, I'm not the uh, uh, only African people here. You have another African people here. Yeah. For us, we need what we need. The first one is 
what we can do maybe this evening or tomorrow. Because we are a developing countries. The people want every day something to eat, to do, or to, to, you know, to, to do something. And uh, for us, we, we can plan the people, the African, the normal people can plan until one year or two years. Is every day, every 24 hours is his uh, first preoccupation. Briefly, Secretary Lehman. Oh, mm, I agree that we, we have to be able to explain in a simple way, in a practical way, what are the SDGs, but especially why do they matter to the real lives of the citizens? So I, I think in general, uh, well, first of all, probably there's a little bit of a generational divide. I think the younger generation, I, I feel it, and when we launched the GovTech, I saw it very well, really adhere to this. Uh, sometimes, well, uh, you, you have more difficulty in explaining to the older generations or less informed, but still I think that we can be able to, to explain the importance of this. But we need to, and I agree with that, we need to make a greater effort to spread it to the population because it's a fact that probably most of the population never heard uh, this expression. And so that's what we try to do starting with GovTech, but we are doing uh, other initiatives. But I, I believe what is important is that we are very practical in explaining especially why this matters to them. And when we talk about, some are quite obvious, ending poverty and hunger, I think people can relate to that. But, uh, well, I, 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 think, I think that it's not a major issue. What we need really is to embrace and to uh, put these goals really into our agenda and our policies. And policies that are not uh, exclusively governmental, but more and more, they are activators of change in the private sector. So more to do for everybody. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for being an attentive audience and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you.